Good evening. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Alan Dangor. I'm a lecturer in nutrition, public health nutrition at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, one house housekeeping thing before we start, which is that this talk is being video recorded by that nice gentleman over there. So um, that is that. And if there's a fire, then there are exits. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to this keynote distinguished lecture, which is one of the highlights of a two-day conference um, organized by the Leverhulme Center for Integrative Research on Agriculture and Health. And our conference is on the links between agriculture, food systems, and non-communicable diseases, um, especially in low-income countries. Uh, in 2002, um, I gave my first ever paper at an international meeting. The meeting was in Albuquerque, in New Mexico. I was trying to remember what the meeting was about, or indeed what my paper was about, and I have absolutely no recollection. But three big things stick in my mind from that meeting. The first big thing was big meals. I don't like leaving waste on my plate, and this was my first ex uh, experience of the depressing reality of the massive food portion sizes that have come to represent food culture in much of the West. More is better, and to hell with the consequences. My second big thing was big hair. Uh, I skipped my mega meal on the second night of the conference and headed off to a rather upmarket wine bar full of wealthy golf club owners. Conversation was understandably slow. I, I don't really play golf. But spirits momentarily rose when two women um, walked over to me. Uh, they rose until uh, the dreaded words were uttered. So exactly what is going on with the big hair? <laughs> and the third thing <laughs> was big food. Uh, for the trip, which was an endless flight to Albuquerque, I bought myself a copy of Food Politics, written by tonight's speaker. And it totally transformed my understanding of the power and politics that surround food systems and the food that we eat. It introduced me to concepts such as the revolving door that gracefully shuffles high-level representatives between posts in the food industry and government, and the way that national food guidelines can be manipulated with subtle word changes to send out eat more rather than eat less messages. Unlike my paper in Albuquerque, these are unforgettable concepts from an unforgettable book. So to tonight's speaker, it is an enormous privilege for me to introduce Professor Marion Nessel. Marion has a PhD in molecular biology and an MPH in public health nutrition from the University of California, Berkeley. She is the Paulette Goddard Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies and Public Health and Professor of Sociology at, the, at New York University. <coughs> in a series that has just been published in PLOS Medicine, Marion opens her paper with Let's begin with a blunt conclusion. Global food systems are not meeting the, word, the world's dietary needs. About one billion people are hungry, while two billion people are overweight. Marion's views are challenging those at the very highest level in the food industry, public health and government, and should similarly challenge us to think much more critically about the food system in which we live. So, without further ado, I am delighted to welcome Professor Marion Nessel to give the keynote distinguished lecture entitled The Politics of Food, The View from 2012. Marion. Thank you so much for that introduction. I was terrified that you were going to say something about my big hair. <laughs> It's, it's a great honor to be here uh, and a great pleasure. I've certainly enjoyed the meeting today and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about some of the things that everybody's been talking about all day. Um, and I should start out by saying that I, I think the reason that I was asked to give this talk was because I think of myself as a food systems person. And by food systems, I mean everything about food from production to consumption, 
um, and the relationship between agriculture, food, nutrition, and public health. My work over certainly the last 10 or 15 years has looked at the intersection of, of these various aspects of our food system, uh, usually from a fairly critical perspective. Um, when I was asked to talk about uh, global food issues in 2012, um, I tried to think of the ones that I'm most concerned about, and as somebody who's involved in public health, we decide how important program problems are by the numbers, and it's very clear that the number of people who uh, suffer from food system problems, either because they don't have enough food or because they have too much food, um, make undernutrition and overnutrition, the two most important public health nutrition problems in the world. And my particular interest is on the effects of food processing and marketing on both of those. Um, let me say something first about the food insecurity or hunger part of this. Uh, in 2010, the Food and Agriculture Organization announced what passes for good news on the international scene. There were under a billion people in the world who were chronically hungry, uh, but in recent years, those numbers have started going up again internationally. And even in the United States, the numbers of people considered food insecure are going up so that there were 46 million Americans who got food assistance from the government last year. Seems like a lot. Um, we know how to fix problems of food insecurity and world hunger. The challenge is not feeding 9 billion people. The challenge is really doing something uh, to make sure that people have the food they need. And the kinds of things that have been shown over and over and over again to work are promotion of breastfeeding, making sure that people have clean water and safe food, empowerment of women, education, uh, development of sustainable agriculture, Culture systems, doing something about income equity, and making sure that you have a stable political system so that people can make food and grow food and produce food on their own. What's important about this particular list is that these are all social solutions. They're ways in which society can improve the health of citizens. They really don't require complicated technical solutions. The, uh, this, was, this idea was put into a very systematic framework in 1990 by UNICEF which put together this framework for looking at um, childhood and adult malnutrition. And what's interesting about the framework is that the outcome, which is malnutrition and death, uh, has an immediate cause, and food, or the lack thereof, is the immediate cause of malnutrition and death. But most of this framework deals with underlying causes and basic causes, and these are all social and political. They have to do with health services and inadequate education and the kinds of institutions that people live in, the kind of politics and ideological superstructure that people live in, how much money they have, and the political resources that are available. And if we want to intervene in, in, mal, in doing something about malnutrition, we really have to change society and change political institutions. And those, of course, are much harder to deal with than just giving food aid or doing something like that. But if we want to make lasting changes, we need to make systemic changes uh, to that. And I mention this because Many of the international efforts to try to do something about hunger and malnutrition um, are focusing on something quite different from changing institutions. For example, this is scaling up nutrition, which those of you who are at this conference today heard something about this morning, which is an international effort to try to do something about hunger and malnutrition. And one of its, um, one of its uh, programs and major ways of doing this is engaging the business community. And I want to say a little bit about that because um, engaging the business community according to scaling up nutrition adds value to the entire food product change. And there are lots of ways in which food companies might be expected to do that. One of which, uh, I thought this was an amazing example, uh, was fortified complementary foods in the Cote d'Ivoire, where um, 
there's an Ivoirian company and Helen Keller International, with the support of GAIN, are working together to promote the consumption of Farinor, a fortified complementary food. And the project targets more than 90% of um, children's ages 6 to 24 months in the country, or a total of 1.5 million children. Um, and the idea is to feed them this product, not teach people how to grow their own food, produce their own food, or take care of their own needs. Um, the most uh, obvious example of this kind of monetization approach to doing something about hunger and malnutrition is probably Plumpy Nut, which is a peanut butter and sugar product um, produced um, by a company in France and then in the United States also. And what's it was originally designed to uh, help in acute malnutrition situations where there was an acute crisis. Um, but since then, it has expanded its reach into trying to do something about moderate malnutrition shown in orange. And then the one that I'm most interested in, which is preventing malnutrition, which is all those little green dots. Um, and I, so I'll show you a couple of these line extensions. Supplementary plumpy nut, which is suitable for adolescents, pregnant women, nursing mothers, and adults. Um, and plumpy nut itself, which was developed for acute situations, but is now being advertised as a supplement suitable for all people from uh, the age of six months on. So there are prod these are products that are being promoted to do something that are, these are not social solutions, these are technical solutions, and while they may be very good in emergency situations, their use as supplements um, for all people of all ages raises lots and lots of questions that I hope this meeting will discuss. That's really all I'm going to say about that side of the uh, public health problem, and I want to turn attention to obesity uh, and to the nutrition transition where we see countries throughout the world that have uh, undernutrition and overnutrition in the country at the same time. This has been given its own name, the nutrition transition. And I want to talk about the situation in the United States a little bit um, as kind of background to some of the things I'll say later. Um, this is an, uh, an amazing time to be a nutritionist in the United States. Uh, certainly the first time in my lifetime that someone in the White House was interested in the same kinds of issues that I am. And it's kind of a thrilling time to be a nutritionist, to be a nutritionist uh, with Michelle Obama's campaign to try to do something about childhood obesity. And people think that this is very complicated, but I don't. Dietary advising is really simple. If you're worried about obesity, you eat less, you move more, you eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, you don't eat too much junk food, please enjoy what you're eating, and please don't eat my book. But if it seems more complicated than that, it's surely because of what the eat less message does to the food industry. And this was beautifully expressed by an executive of Coca-Cola a few years ago who talked about how the, um, for, the, for the food industry, the Achilles heel has become the discussion about obesity. It used to be something they could completely ignore. And now it's something they have to fuss about every single day. Eating less is very bad for business. Um, now, to understand what's happened with obesity, I want to talk about the situation in the United States, particularly because we have a great deal of information about how it started and why it started. Uh, rates of obesity in the States did not start to increase until the early 1980s can be dated pretty precisely to 1983 to 1985. Up until then, rates were at about 15%. Now they're much higher. So this raises the obvious question, what happened in the early 1980s uh, to make rates of obesity go up, meaning e either that people would be moving less or eating more. Now, I'm not going to say much about um, moving less, uh, because there's not much to be said about that, but there's plenty of evidence that people are eating more. Um, and one of the things that happened in the early 1980s was that people began eating outside the home more. Food in restaurants tends to have more calories than food eaten at home. Much of the restaurants were fast food restaurants. There was an enormous proliferation of fast food restaurants starting in 1980 and going up to the 2000s. Um, and those, these places have 
serve food that has more calories. The other main source of calories came from the introduction of larger size portions. This is my former doctoral student, now Dr. Lisa Young. At her thesis defense, she measured the introduction of large size portions into the food supply. The white cup on the left is a Department of Agriculture regulation size cup um, for a soft drink. It holds eight ounces and about 100 calories worth of soda. The other cups all came from our local movie theater. And the double gulp, if it doesn't have too much ice in it, holds 64 ounces and 800 calories. And the evidence shows that that's not consumed by, one, by you know, that, that cup is not passed down the row in the movie theater and shared among everyone. It's usually consumed by one person. If I had one thing I could teach everybody, it would be that larger portions have more calories. Um, <laughs> something that I guarantee is not intuitively obvious. Now, Lisa's thesis work, one of the things that Lisa did in her thesis work was to compare the introduction of large size portions shown on the bottom graph in bars. Uh, and she could show that large size portions were first noticeable in the States in the early 1980s. And then they, there are more and more and more of them introduced. She could compare that to the increase in the number of calories available in the food supply. That's the green bar in the middle. It was pretty flat until the early 1980s. And then it went up by 700 calories a day per capita. That's not what people are eating. Eating. It's what's available in the food supply. And all of that happened in parallel with rising rates of obesity. Um, and I want to talk about what that, what that was about. Um, because the reason for the introduction of large portions and the increase in calories in the food supply had to do with a couple of deregulatory policies. The first was agriculture. Um, in the late 1970s, the Department of Agriculture changed its policies from paying farmers to leave fields fallow and conserve land to paying them to grow as much food as they possibly could. Our farmers were really good at that. And the result of that was mountains of corn in a sea of farm subsidies and a lot more calories in the food supply. Um, but there was a second area of deregulation, also fairly remote from food itself, and that had to do with what happened on Wall Street in 1981. Um, Jack Welch, who was then uh, chair of General Electric, gave a speech in which he said, enough of this blue chip stock stuff, long-term slow return on investments. We don't want that anymore. We want higher immediate returns on investment. Uh, and that was the shareholder value movement. And it had a pretty profound result, because Wall Street began evaluating corporations not only on the basis of their making a profit, but on their ability to grow their profits every 90 days and report growth to Wall Street every 90 days. The result of all of this was enormous competition um, for lots of corporations, but for food corporations, it was particularly difficult because now there were 700 calories a day per capita more available in the food supply, uh, and that had to be sold. And it wasn't enough just to sell food products in that food environment, but they had to grow their profits on those products every 90 days. And the result of that was that food companies, in order to sell, Products. They weren't, food companies didn't sit around conference tables saying, let's figure out how to make Americans fat. They sat around America, they sat around food, about, around conference tables saying, let's see how we can sell our products in this incredibly competitive food environment. And they did it in a lot of interesting ways. The larger portions came out of that. It was cheap to make large portions because the price of food was so low. Um, and the other thing they did was they put food everywhere. Um, so I like to ask the question, when did it become OK to eat in bookstores? Uh, probably some of you can remember when you couldn't go into a bookstore if you were carrying a drink or food. They wouldn't let you in. Um, food in the United States is everywhere. 
Uh, it's in Duane Reed pharmacies, which are all over New York City. It's in household supply stores, such as Bed Bath and & Beyond, and Staples, an office supply store, now looks like a grocery store. All of these places are not only carrying snacks, but also um, foods that have to be kept cold, like milk and other perishables, and they all are all selling prepared foods now, so you can buy sandwiches at them. There's food everywhere. Um, sorry, wrong way. Um, proximity is another one. There was a big push to put vending machines into schools um, because the research showed that the more vending machines that you had, the more product people bought out of them. And then low prices was another. Uh, it's hard to argue against low prices for food because it enables the poor to buy food, but you have to ask the question, where are the prices low? And if you go into an American McDonald's with $5, you can buy five hamburgers or one salad. That's federal pricing, um, pricing policies in action. Um, and if poor people think that fruits and vegetables are expensive, it's because they are expensive. And that is shown by Department of Commerce statistics on the change in the indexed price of food commodities from 1980 to the present, the same period of time. In that period, uh, the price of fresh fruits and vegetables index price went up by 40%, whereas the prices of beer, butter, and sodas went down by 15 to 30% or so. Um, so this is a federal policy in action. It has to do with what gets supported and what doesn't get supported. So all in all, uh, over that year, what happened was creating an a food environment in the United States that encouraged people to eat more food, um, not less. And that's exactly what happened. Now these are the kinds of things that a lawyer in San Francisco and a food advocate named Michelle Simon wrote in her book, Ad Appetite for Profit, how the food industry undermines our health and how to fight back. It's a manual on how to fight the food industry. And in it, she talked about the enormous pressures on food companies from advocates who want them to make better food, from regulators who want to regulate them, for lawyers who want to sue them, and for Wall Street that simply wants them to make more money every 90 days. And food companies started out by doing nothing, uh, ignoring it, and then going through all the stages of death and denial. Um, and then finally, they began to do what they're doing now, which is to change products to make them look like they're healthier, um, and I'll, with health claims and functional foods and self-endorsements about how healthy they are, and also fighting back um, through lobbying, attacking advocates, blaming inactivity, blaming personal choice, and co-opting their critics, and I'll say a little bit about um, those as we go along. Let me say something first about health claims, because if you go to an American grocery store, this is what you see. Practically every product has a health claim on it for cancer or prevention of heart disease, and these claims were allowed starting in 1990 by the act that put the nutrition facts labels on food labels. Um, and these health claims had to have some scientific substantiation behind them. Not a whole lot, but they had to have some. Over the years, as companies applied for health claims, but were unable to produce even minimal scientific substantiation, the FDA would turn the claims down, and the companies took the Food and Drug Administration to court. And in 2003, the FDA just gave up on trying to insist on scientific substantiation for health claims, and they said we lost eight of ten First Amendment decisions in the courts, and doing business the way we were doing it was unsustainable. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, with the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, um, but when I went to high school, I learned that it was about, in my civics classes, I learned that it was about freedom of political and religious speech. It never occurred to me that the First Amendment could be used to protect the right of food corporations to market junk foods to children, for example, but that is the way our courts have interpreted it, and given our current Supreme Court, it's very, very unlikely that that's going to change. Um, so we now have a situation uh, where 
where health claims have proliferated, and because health claims are, have proliferated, functional foods have proliferated. Functional foods are foods that have something extra beyond their normal nutritional value um, added to them that's supposed to improve health. And I've listed the major kinds of, vi of functional foods. They contain vitamins and minerals and omega-3s and probiotics, which we heard about today, and herbal supplements of various kinds. Um, these have been responsible for phenomenal increases in sales of these kinds of foods. You practically cannot sell a food product in the States unless it's got some functional ingredients. Whether it has anything to do with health is highly debatable. Um, the uh, Federal Trade Commission is constantly trying to rein in advertising of some of these functional foods um, because the science just simply doesn't back up the claims that are being made. Palm, which is pomegranate juice, may be an antioxidant superpower, but most of the recent research on or clinical trials looking at antioxidants have shown that not only do they not do any good, but they may actually do some harm. Uh, this doesn't stop companies from putting health claims on food products because it's the only thing that sells food products these days. And if you do behavioral research to ask consumers what they think of these kinds of products, mostly what they think is that if it's got a health claim on it, it doesn't have any calories um, and they buy it. Um, so you put an organic uh, claim on a product, it influences calorie judgments and exercise recommendations. And if you put it on fast food health claims, uh, people will eat more as a result because they think that the health claims take the calories away. Too bad. Doesn't work. Sorry about that. Um, and the obvious way in which food companies are selling products is through media advertising. It's very difficult to get figures on the advertising budgets for specific food products, but every now and then Advertising Age publishes a few. And, in, and last year, just about this time last year, um, they published that Kellogg spent $47.2 million just to advertise Pop-Tarts just Pop-Tarts, and 19.7 million for Fruit Loops, a sugary cereal. And these are just expenditures for um, advertising that goes through advertising agencies. Other forms of advertising are in addition to that. Um, and much of that advertising goes to products that David Kessler, a former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, thinks may have addictive properties. So these kinds of things uh, induced David Ludwig, who's a pediatrician at Harvard, and me to write an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association several years ago, asking the question, can the food industry play a constructive role in the obesity epidemic? We were dubious. Um, and we were dubious because we think the goals of industry, which are to make profits and increase profits every 90 days, are not necessarily congruent with public health goals and sometimes work directly against public health goals, particularly if the public health goal is to eat less um, of, of junk foods in particular, then the industry goals are going to be very discrepant for that. Now, I say this because this is an enormous topic of debate this year, um, in the, these days, and many of our colleagues are debating whether the, what the role of the food industry should be um, in tackling the, gro the global burden of undernutrition um, and improving child health in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there are food industry representatives who are writing editorials in professional journals in which they say, yes, the food industry has an important role to play in doing something about malnutrition, and in fact, you can't fix malnutrition without us. And on the other hand, there are public health advocates who say, no way. Um, you cannot, that, that the interests of food companies and the interests of public health are so divergent that there really shouldn't be any alliance between them. 
Um, and in fact, when there is a company that ostensibly makes comments or makes decisions that they're going to make healthier products, uh, whether they're really making healthier products or not is something we can argue about. Um, but the head of Pepsi-Cola did attempt to do that or at least talked about doing that. Um, and she was accused of just doing public relations and the, the investors in PepsiCo got really upset about it when PepsiCo sales began to decline. Um, and so this in a way reinforces the idea that food companies are in a position where they cannot afford to have their sales go down. No matter what they do, they have to increase their sales every 90 days. Now, sodas are an interesting case because there are data on what's happening to soda sales throughout the world. And in the United States, between 2002 and 2007, sales of sodas actually declined. Whereas in Australasia, Western Europe, Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, Latin America and Eastern Europe, they have gone up. So this raises the whole question about what's going on with the marketing of um, junk foods and sodas in developing countries. And I started noting, noticing this first in about 2010 um, when I began to see uh, articles in the business pages of newspapers about profits for food companies in emerging markets and developing countries. So here's Kraft profit climbs on sales in, America, in emerging markets, and PepsiCo's profits almost doubled on overseas beverages. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of these. Um, strong Asian sales bolster Coca-Cola in the fourth quarter. That was the fourth quarter of 2011. Here's what happened in the first quarter of 2012. Uh, sales grew around the world in the first quarter, led by consumption in India, where the volume se uh, increased by 20%. Um, here's the second quarter of 2012, a fistful of dollars more, Coke's Coke pumps $3 billion uh, into India. Achieving continued sustainable, responsible growth in India is core to achieving Coca-Cola's vision of doubling its revenues in the next decade. Um, here is Nestle, no relation. Um, the sun sets in the east, emerging markets to deliver for Nestle in 2011. Nestle has just bought uh, a unit of Pfizer. Why on earth would uh, Nestle invest in, a pharma, in an infant nutrition business? Why would it do that? Because it will gain greater access to the fast-growing emerging, emerging markets like China and Saudi Arabia. Uh, here's Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is savoring its potential in Africa. Here's McDonald's, which, uh, globe, which has its profits lifted on global sales, is pushing for more gains in China, and is expanding in India. Um, Domino's sees a bigger slice overseas. I mean, every comp company that you can think of is talking about overseas sales. Domino's fastest growing market is India, where it reached 400 locations last year. How many this year? I can't wait to see. Um, India is interesting. I was there a couple of years ago, and I don't know what anybody else does when they go to countries like India, but I go to grocery stores and buy Kellogg's products. Um, and this was a box of Kellogg's cho chocolate cereal, you know, chocolate cocoa puffs, um, with a Krishna thing on the front. I thought it was adorable, but what really got my attention was what was on the back, uh, because uh, the back said being a mother is quite difficult. One serving of this chocolate sugary cereal has the goodness of two chapatis. I read that. I read that not as for a filled tummy and a happy mummy, but I read that as a deliberate attempt to undermine the indigenous food that is being served to children in India. Uh, so the idea is to replace chapatis uh, with um, a chocolate sugary cereal. 
Um, and this is also shown by what's happening in Central America. Um, and I'm indebted to Emily Yates Store, who's here. Thank you, Emily, um, for in 2005 bringing me a set of slides uh, from her anthropology field placement in Guatemala at a town that was. Um, I think 50 kilometers from the nearest city. And what she did was to talk to me about the introduction of, of PepsiCo and other uh, international processed food companies into this town which had never seen it before. And this has consequences that go way beyond just the mere idea of selling sodas. And this is shown by a friend of mine who's a doctor, a former student of mine actually, a doctor in San Francisco, uh, Karen Sokol Gutierrez, who was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador in the late 1970s. And this is a photograph from her Peace Corps uh, experience with these lovely children with beautiful smiles. A few years ago, she began working in El Salvador and was absolutely shocked to discover that kids' teeth are completely rotted out all throughout uh, Central and Latin America. And she's got a big project where she's got UCSF students going down to um, and medical students going down to El Salvador and trying to teach um, parents about brushing kids' teeth and maybe making sure that the kids aren't eating so much sugary food. Um, what is the reason for this? It's because of the introduction of all of these products into Central America. And just a couple of weeks ago, PBS NewsHour did a program on, uh, Karen's, pro uh, on Karen's program, and, uh, and you can go on and listen to the PBS NewsHour and watch this whole story about what's happened to kids' teeth uh, and the an epidemic blamed on junk food. But what fascinated me were the statements of the um, uh, soda companies. Uh, here's Pepsi's, and this comes right out of the program, sc with screenshots, you can do wonderful things. Um, with basic dental hygiene practices, people have enjoyed our products for decades. Uh, in other words, it's their fault for not brushing their teeth. And here's, um, Coca-Cola's much more complicated statement, we believe that parents should decide what their children eat and drink. This is a matter of choice, personal choice. But then it says that any food or beverage containing sugars and starches, including some of our beverages, can contribute to the development of cavities. I don't know whether this is sharing the blame or taking, um, or taking responsibility for it, but I thought it was a really interesting statement. And then one more of these, um, and that's another Kellogg cereal, this time in Panama. Um, and I bought this box because of what was on the side panel, uh, which was a endorsement by the Pediatric Association of Guatemala on a sugary, chocolatey cereal um, sold in Panama. So this raises the whole question about partnerships and alliances, particularly with um, with medical and health organizations. This is co-opting your critics. Now, I would be very depressed about this, except that in the States, we're in the middle of a food revolution. Um, I like, that's Alice Waters at the top of this, a famous chef in the United States, and that's me underneath her holding a cereal box. Um, so I like this, and if the New York Times says that a food revolution is, is happening, it's happening, because that's the paper of record. Um, but there, the food revolution in the States takes many different forms. Um, it is the organic revolution, the slow food revolution, the locavore movement, um, the animal welfare movement, and the edible um, I call the edible movement, which are these magazines all over the United States that are talking about food movement issues uh, throughout the country. Um, and the food movement is having interesting effects. Part of the food movement is to try to do something about obesity and to try to improve health. And when President Obama uh, signed the Affordable Care Act, which as of this week is constitutional, um, when he signed it in 2010, there was a little known clause in it that made calorie labeling national. 
Um, and so one of the food politics worries about uh, the Supreme Court's decision on the Health Reform Act was would calorie labeling survive? Calorie labeling started in New York City in, 20, in 2008. Um, and for any of you who've been in New York and have seen it, it's pretty revelatory. You wouldn't believe how many calories all that stuff has. Um, and I live in New York City, which has a very interesting configure, political configuration. It has, um, for the second time, a commissioner of health who is astonishingly actually interested in public health and wants to do something about the health of New Yorkers, backed up by an extraordinarily over-the-top wealthy mayor who doesn't care what anybody thinks of him um, and backs the health department to the hilt. And so we have calorie labeling even at baseball games. We've got calorie labeling in subways. Um, the, these are subway posters. One of them says how many miles you have to walk in order to burn off the calories in one 20 ounce soda and there were things about how many packets of sugar are in sodas of various sizes. Um, the latest campaign from this year is focused on portion size trying to uh, encourage people in English and Spanish to reduce the size of the food they eat because larger portions have more calories. But of course the big thing that the mayor did uh, was at the end of May to announce that he was going to ban sodas that were larger than 16 ounces from several institutions and various ways in the city. Um, and this has gotten a pretty amazing reaction. His rationale for doing that was that a 16 ounce soda has about 200 calories and about 50 grams of sugars in it. 200 calories is about 10% of, of the calories in a 2,000 calorie a day diet. You know, a pretty a ballpark figure for what an, an average might be. And 50 grams of sugars is just at the upper limit of what public health people are recommending people consume no more than. Um, so it's kind of the upper limit. You have one of those and you've done your sugars um, and you've done your, your uh, extra calories for the day. Uh, another reason for that 16 ounce size was that in the 1950s at least, Coca-Cola was advertising a 16 ounce soda as serving three people. Portion sizes have increased. Um, larger portions have more calories. I can't emphasize that enough. The pushback on Mayor Bloomberg's rather modest proposal, if you ask me, he didn't say an eight ounce soda. The pushback on it has been absolutely um, amazing and absolutely um, e perfect examples of exactly the way the food industry reacts in these kinds of situations. The American Beverage Association, which represents Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper, published a full page ad in the New York Times, our soda and sugar sweetened beverages driving obesity, not according to the facts. So here they are spinning the science uh, for their own purposes. So number one, you attack the science. Number two is you attack the advocates. This was another full page ad in the New York Times. I don't know how much those things cost, 80 or $100,000. Uh, this one put in by the Center for Consumer Freedom, uh, or I should say the so-called Center for Consumer Freedom because it's really a public relations arm, a secret public relations arm for the food industry. Um, and this is the nanny. You only, you only thought you lived in the land of the free, but here is a nanny Bloomberg taking your um, freedom away. And Mayor Bloomberg, when asked about this ad, said, oh, I would never wear a dress like that. <laughs> it's so unflattering. He's got a sense of humor. Um, and to, in today's New York Times, um, picked up online, uh, there's an investigative report on what the soda makers are doing in order to lobby against um, the New York ban on the large, it's not really a ban, and they're not making them go away. They're only, you're only allowed to have them of this size. You can buy 20 of them if you want to. And the article talks about um, how there, there's a grassroots 
they're funding a grassroots style campaign. There's a website. They've got t-shirts. I picked out my beverage all by myself. The whole thing focused on freedom of choice and personal choice on this. Um, and of course, the amount of money that the soda companies are putting into lobbying is astronomical. Um, there was a very nice graph in 2010 showing the increase in the amount of lobbying dollars from the American Beverage Association, Coke and Pepsi, when the whole question of soda taxes came up. Um, and PepsiCo was report lobbying budget for 2011 was said to be $29 million. It's, if you're a public health advocate, you don't have that kind of money. Um, and the amount of money that's going into fighting these kinds of things, I suppose, is a tribute to how effective these campaigns um, are considered to be. But if you're in public health, this is what you're up against. So Mal Nesheim and I, in our book, Why Calories Count, which is uh, my most recent book, um, talk about what you as an individual need to do if you're worried about obesity. You need to get organized and figure out how you're going to deal with it. You need to eat less, eat better, move more. But it's, and that's all voting with your fork stuff. You make a decision every time you uh, choose a food. But you have to do much more of that. You have to get political in order to try to create a food environment that that's more conducive uh, to eating healthfully. And I was very impressed. I was given this um, SCN News, the Standing Committee on Nutrition uh, from the United Nations, um, and this publication on nutrition and business that has articles written by people in this room, uh, talking about how to engage with the food industry and what needs to be done in order to try to improve the food environment, um, both from the standpoint of preventing hunger and malnutrition and preventing obesity. Uh, and as already been mentioned, the Public Library of Science, Medicine, online series on big food. Um, we've had two weeks of it so far. There's one more week to go. Uh, and there are a lot of articles that have been written here, too, on what to do about big food and how to deal with the food industry, which is so much of influence on what people are eating. Um, so, uh, we had in New York City last year um, Occupy Wall Street, and I was kind of excited. It's actually some students in our department uh, did Occupy Big Food as part of that, and they're now Occupy movements having to do um, with all of these ideas about how if we're going to do something about malnutrition, um, hunger, and obesity, we're going to have to change the food system in very profound ways, and that we're going to have to do that through, through social change and through political change. Um, and I'll end here and just exhort all of you to get busy. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fantastic talk, Marion. Thank you very, very much. Marion very kindly has offered to stay on and I'll answer some questions. Um, there are, there's a roving microphone, so please do wait for the microphone before you ask your question. And please introduce yourself before you ask your question. Thank you. First question, there. And I'll take two or three questions. I think that's probably best. Oh, that's how we're doing it. That's fine. Will you remember them? No, I won't. <laughs> um, Tara Garnett from the Food Climate Research Network. Um, that was a really, really great uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, clearly, the food industry are the problem, or at least a very, very major problem, but we also need a food industry because uh, most of us are not going to be growing our own food. So what is a, a solution for the food industry? Is it... Is the problem scale and power? How do you, how do you develop a food industry that is uh, accountable? Hello, um, my name is Byrne, Jerome Byrne. I'm a journalist. And uh, I just want to be interested to know your comment on the dietitians as a profession. Um, as somebody who has been following food, I, I know in this country that the problems with food is that people eat too much fat, 
and uh, that they should uh, watch their diet. Um, I don't hear very much about problems with the food industry and I don't hear very much about problems with sugar providing it's part of a healthy balanced diet although I'm never quite sure what that is either. So I just wonder whether it's a profession that has really kept up with what's been going on behind the scenes as it were, or the picture that you've sketched out for us today. Hi there, my name is Nicholas. I'm a graduate student at the London School of Economics. Um, I'd like to question an underlying assumption which I see in, in your research. Two points you raise are one, eat less, and two, move more. That appears to me to be based on the simple assumption that a calorie in is a calorie out. Now, Work by Dr. Lustig in the States and Gary Taubes as well um, seems to indicate that there's a bit more of an asymmetric uh, mechanism working into the consumption of calories there. And I just wonder if you've got any comment there with respect to, to policy. All right, let's start with the, uh, well, these are really good questions. We do need a food industry, but we don't need Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. Uh, they're not required nutrients, as to the last I heard. Um, I'm a great believer in regulation. I don't, I'm not opposed to profits. I think companies can make profits and sell whatever they want to. Um, I don't like the idea that they can market them to children. I don't like the idea that they can make health claims for them that are not borne out by real data. Uh, so, I'd like to see some checks and balances. Right now, they're, un they're basically, at least in the States, they're I think you do better here in Europe than we do, but they're basically unregulated in the States. I think we need some checks and balances. Um, and if they're going to make comments that they're going, I mean, one of the things we see over and over and over again are food companies making enormous announcements that they're going to change their product line, they're going to stop marketing to children, and they're going to do all these good things. And I've seen this one after another after another. Um, there is no accountability for it, so I'd like to see them held accountable. Uh, dietitians as a profession, I'm not a dietitian, and so uh, I'm an outsider uh, in this, although I'm in a department that trains dietitians, and I've been to dietetics meetings, and really they're extraordinary. Every single piece of it is supported by a, f a food company of one kind or another. In food politics, I wrote about the, uh, um, the, the, sh the instruction sheets or the information sheets on various uh, food issues and disease. And I said in food politics that you could predict who the sponsor was of those information sheets by what they said about whether that, whether sugar had anything to do with diabetes or any other disease, for example. Um, and I hoped that by embarrassing them, by writing about them in food politics, that they would at least stop doing those, inf those sponsored information sheets, but I failed. Sorry about that. Um, I don't think anyone will take the dietetics profession seriously until they clean up their act and stop being um, bought completely by food companies. But at the same time, I'm a member of the uh, American Society for Nutrition, which is a, a, an organization of scientists and researchers, and they take money from food companies too. They pay for the journal and so forth. It's a pervasive problem throughout the entire nutrition profession. Um, and one that I think needs to be addressed much more than it has been. Um, and oh, thank you for the calorie question. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, we just wrote a book called Why Calorie, Mal Nesheim and I wrote a book called Why Calories Count, in which we review the literature on whether it makes any difference where the calories come from. From the standpoint of metabolism and health, 
or from the standpoint of metabolism, it makes no difference at all where the calories come from. From the standpoint of health, it makes a big difference. And I spent a couple of hours on a train with um, Robert Lustig uh, trying to push him on whether sugar really is a poison, um, as, as he has been quoted as saying. He denies saying that, but he's certainly been quoted as saying that. Um, and what I was particularly interested in was whether there was a cut point at which, um, at which you could say, you know, some sugar is okay. I love sugar. I don't know about anybody else. I really like it, and I'm, I'm a dessert person. Um, and at what point should I be worried that I'm poisoning myself or messing up my liver with too much fructose? And the figure, then he gave me a figure, and the figure was, interestingly enough, 50 grams of sugars, um, of which half would be fructose. So that's 25 grams of fructose. 50 grams of sugar is exactly what's in one of those 16 ounce sodas. Um, so if you push the physicians and the scientists who are working on this really hard, they'll tell you that they think that calories are calories, uh, and they really are. And you don't need complicated explanations for obesity. People are eating more, uh, and there's plenty of evidence to back that up. Um, should I do three more? Would you, yeah, I think it would be wonderful if you would. Yeah, would be do three more. There's one down this, here at the front. This is an interesting process. <laughs> <laughs> I could do them one at a time, too. It would oh, be okay. much easier. No, it's, it's more efficient. Though. You like, this is more efficient? And we okay. like efficiency. You like efficiency. Okay. <laughs> there are hands all over yeah, the place. Yeah, and over there. Mm. I'm John Whiting, as I reminded you before the talk. Yes. I recorded your equally brilliant presentation about a decade ago to the Guild of Food Writers. And it, I'm delighted that the challenge continues. My question to you now is, the Occupy Wall Street movement has got its big push from the fact that more and more people in America have become desperately, unbearably poor. What kind of an ecological and biological disaster will it take for people to become angry at having not at having not enough food, but paradoxically at having too much. Uh, thanks, I'm Deborah Johnston and I'm based here at SOAS. And the question that I have is this, it was a fantastic presentation and you explain why it's a good time to be doing work on this right now in the, um, in the US. But I wondered if the good, if the good news in terms of new regulation in the States was actually bad news for other parts of the world. And I guess I'm thinking about the evidence we have that shows that actually what you know, big food does is it won't actually produce less. It will just shift to different m markets. And whether that's tobacco um, being increasingly sold in developing countries or whether that's sh sugar being sold um, in other parts of the, of the world or trans fats being sold in in countries that don't have such strong, reg, such strong regulation, there does seem to be a problem of you know big companies shifting to markets that are much easier to actually sell in. Uh, yeah, Darren Daly, University of Leeds. Um, we hear a lot in the media now about taxation as a public health policy with respect to food, and you've pointed out uh, the perverse existence of agricultural subsidies, and I feel like those conversations happen often in isolation, independently of one another. Um, my own personal opinion is it seems somewhat odd to tax something to make it more expensive while at the same time making it easier and cheaper to produce. Uh, I guess I'd just like to hear if you had any opinions on that uh, mm -hmm. general topic. You want to do one more? One more, one more. Okay. Um, my name is Patrick Holford. I'm a, a nutritionist. The, the sort of implication is that obesity is the issue, but the consequence of obesity is this unbelievable rise in diabetes, um, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's now. And these are medical issues. And we trust the medical profession. Uh, but there are some who say that the, it's not just big pharma with an F that we need to be concerned about. It's big pharma with a pH. 
And the medical profession, at least in this country, have been remarkably complacent about addressing these issues to do with calories, to do with sugar, and so on. I'd be grateful if you could address that part of the politics equation. Well, thank you for those questions, uh, very good ones. Um, what is it going to take to get people upset about income inequity? I wish I knew. Um, it seems to me that that's the single most important political issue that we have to deal with. It's the root of many, many, many problems. Um, and of course, one of the great puzzles of American politics is why poor people vote against their own self-interest. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are grappling with and the, it comes down to how issues are framed. Um, the food industry, for example, has ab been able to frame the um, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal for limiting the size of sodas as a freedom of choice issue, um, which seems kind of amazing to me. Uh, and I'm not sure that how, how you go about doing that, but the framing people are working a lot on trying to figure out how to frame issues in ways that people can understand. I don't know, somehow uh, the forces of darkness are better at that than we are. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, yes, big food is exporting um, its, uh, our problems from America. Um, and that's, it, 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 you've got to do something about national governments. Where is the World Health Organization in these kinds of things? Where is the Food and Agriculture Organization? Why aren't they working with their member nations to try to resist some of this and get some of these things regulated? Uh, this seems to me to be an international problem that everybody ought to be working on. Um, taxation is an inconsistent policy? Absolutely. One of the things that happened with the American Farm Bill, which has not been passed yet, but is part way, uh, was to try, there was a big public movement for the first time ever to try to make agricultural policy consistent with health policy. <clears throat> and it looked at lots of different ways in which the Farm Bill did one thing or another, but the Farm Bill historically has supported big commodity producers. It's never been interested in health before. Uh, and so the general hope was that there would be incremental changes. Um, and there are incre incremental changes in the Senate's version of the Farm Bill, uh, which promote fruit and vegetable consumption for the first time. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't know, that's considered a step in the door and the reality of politics is that you can't make these changes because as I'm fond of saying, <clears throat> the government never sat down and looked at the farm bill and said, how can we make the farm bill a vision of what agricultural policy should be? It looked at the farm bill as a collection of programs, how can we pay off the members of agricultural committees <clears throat> and keep our constituents happy. So that's real politics in action. And you have to oppose that through political means. Um, and then the comment about obesity is not the issue, it's the consequences of obesity that are the issue. And I was just reminded by that question of a time when I gave a talk on diet at a meeting of the American, Di a national meeting of the American Diabetes Association and I was the only speaker on diet. I was the only one um, on what you should do about diet as a preventive measure for type 2 diabetes. And I was a little surprised by that. I don't think I understood about the American Diabetes Association until I went down to the exhibit. And I walked into the exhibit and it was Big Pharma in action. Um, it was all drug companies. And I realized, and they were giving away lots and lots of stuff. I still have some pretty great swag from that meeting. Um, the, uh, you know, I like to ask the question to what, what industry would benefit if people in America were healthy? How's that for a cynical question? And I'm sorry to be so cynical, but I couldn't think of a single one. 
I couldn't think of the medical industry benefits by people being overweight and sick, the farmers, you know, the drug industry, the diet industry, all of these industries benefit. And the only group that I could think of that would benefit if people were healthier were not for-profit health maintenance organizations like Kaiser Permanente in California, um, where they would enormously benefit if their patient population were healthier. And of course, the hope is that with a new, with a healthcare system that enrolls all Americans or all Americans who are willing to be enrolled, um, that maybe we'll have an incentive in there for keeping people healthier. Um, so I'm sorry to be so cynical about that, but I think it's an enormous problem. And the way to deal with it is by recognizing it as a problem and not getting involved in uncomfortable alliances and partnerships that put um, health organizations in a completely impossible position where they can't say what they think and in which they are attention is deflected from regulation and accountability, which I think is so necessary. Great. Well, I think um, all that's left for me to do is to invite everyone upstairs for a drink, but also to invite you to thank uh, Marion again for a truly fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.